Right. So starting with the topic of chemical energetics, right? So um hold on. So when we talk about our um, chemical energetics, so we are basically talking about the energy that is produced from your uh, these reactions. The energy that is produced from chemical reactions is basically what we have to study. So before we get into actually uh, the energy production or when we get into types of different uh, chemical reactions, before we do that, let's go over and uh, first discuss what are the sources of energy. So whenever we are dealing with a chemical reaction or whenever we are uh, trying to find a source for energy, what those different sources of energy can be. So one of the major sources of such energy is, of course, going to be your fossil fuels, right? Like these days, that is one of the major sources of energy that we have. Fossil fuel includes your coal. It includes your... Uh, oil, crude oil, and of course, it includes your natural gas. All of these things are considered to be your, uh, these three things are considered to be fossil fuels. And all these three things are, of course, the one of the major sources of energy that we have. So, you know, we need energy, we need heat. What do we do? We burn up the coals, right? So these are like the major sources of energy. So starting with that. Now, when I'm talking to you about it, we have something known as a crude oil. Okay, crude oil is basically, it's of course, like I said, one of the fossil fuel, and it is a mixture of different compounds that we call hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons, uh, when we study organic chemistry, we will do this in more detail, but hydrocarbons are basically organic compounds that, o that only contain carbon and hydrogen. That's it. They have carbon, they have hydrogen and the carbon and hydrogen have a covalent bond between them. That is known as your hydrocarbons and crude oil is made up of a mixture of different sort of hydrocarbons. Now, when we are going to talk about it, we in, uh, so crude oil is generally found underneath the ground. Okay, It is made up of, you know, breakdown of your, uh, what do you call it, your... Uh, fossils your you know animal fossils breakdown of dead plants dead animals dead uh you know different uh organic compounds that uh are going to sort of come together to give you your crude oil now when we're talking about using crude oil we cannot use crude uh we have to we cannot use crude oil as it is because like i said crude oil is a mixture of different hydrocarbons and when it is a mixture of different hydrocarbons every hydrocarbon can be used for a different thing so before we can actually use the crude oil, we have to separate all the different hydrocarbons from each other. So for that, we do something that is known as refining, refining the oil. So refining the oil will allow the crude oil to separate based on different fractions. And the technique you use for it is known as fractional distillation. So fractional distillation is the technique that we use. But of course, this is done on an industry scale. So it is going to be a bit more complex and a bit more, uh, a bit more, uh, a bit different than what we have already studied. But the basic principle is the same. So we know the principle of fractional distillation is to separate two miscible liquids based on their boiling point. For example, you have water and you have ethanol in it, right? Water and ethanol are completely miscible, which means that they will mix together with each other. So what you have to do is, is you are going to have to use their different boiling points. Ethanol has a lower boiling point, water has a higher boiling point. And based on that, you basically separate them from each other. So you have done fractional distillation. So now we're going to see what happens when we are looking into it in terms of crude oil. So this is our fractionating tower that is visible in front of you like this. And in the fractionating tower, we have different levels of temperature, okay? So for example, the bottom of the fractionating tower would have the highest temperature. The top of the fractionating tower would have the lowest temperature. So this is the lowest temperature and this is the highest temperature. What you will do is, is you will take your crude oil and you will put it in the 
fractionating tower. Now, this crude oil has got different uh, compounds in it. It's got different hydrocarbons in it. So what you are going to do is you're going to separate them based on their boiling point. For example, uh, talk about fuel oil, right? Fuel oil or lubricating oil, you can see, it has the highest boiling point over here. So what is going to happen at the, since this, since uh, it has the boiling point of 340 degrees centigrade. So remember this boiling point is also, is the point where your liquid can turn into gas or gas can turn back into liquid. Both the things can happen, right? Your, because that is the point of state change. That is the point of state change. So it can turn into, it can condense back into liquid as well. So the rest of the gases, their boiling point is higher than 340 degrees centigrade. Um, so, sorry, their boiling point is lesser than 340 degrees centigrade. All of the other compounds of oil, their boiling point is lower than 340 degrees centigrade. So they will stay as gases. They will definitely not condense back. They will definitely not turn back into liquid because the temperature is way too high. Only the lubricating oil whose boiling, whose boiling, uh, whose boiling point is really high will condense back and turn into liquid and start to collect over here. Then fuel oil, for example, has the second highest boiling point. So when it reaches the higher, lower temperature, so from 320, for example, when it comes to 260, so your kerosene or your uh, kerosene is uh, has a melting point around, uh, sorry, boiling point around 260. So the rest of the gases above kerosene, they will still stay as a gas because their boiling point is even lower. So their boiling point is lower, so they will stay as gas because they are at a higher temperature. Kerosene, on the other hand, will be able to condense back into liquid and it will start to collect over here. And that will keep on re repeating for each fraction, for each batch of your um, crude oil until it has separated into all of these different compounds. Is that making sense? Okay, all right. So give me a second. Okay. Now, uh, there are certain fractions that you need to have a little bit of an idea about in terms of their uses. So you will get questions like, um, you know, fractionating tower and they will say, oh, explain what is happening and you will give the explanation I just gave you. And then they will say, okay, what is the use of this one? So you need to have a little bit of an idea of all of them. So gas is going to be bottled for heating and cooking. So a lot of, for example, when you go to the rural, rural, uh, rural areas or when, you know, you go camping, what do you do? You take like a cylinder of gas with you. If you're going camping, you take a cylinder of gas with you so you can light the stove over there. So in those situations, that is basically refinery gas that they have gone ahead and they have bottled it and they have taken it. So whenever you guys are traveling, whenever you guys are going hiking, camping, you can use the gas to light up a stove. Then we have gasoline. Gasoline is what is used in our cars in the form of petrol. Naphtha is used to make certain chemicals. Kerosene is used as a fuel in your airplanes. In your airplanes, in your jet engines, that is going to be your kerosene. Then uh, diesel, of course, is used to run diesel engines, which is again going to come in the form of your various cars, various vehicles. Fuel oil is for ships. Lubricating oil is, of course, for making lubricants, waxes, and all that. And then you have a residue. You get a residue at the very end. So like whatever is left behind, that is going to be collected as a residue. Residue, And the residue is used to make bitumen. What is bitumen? Bitumen is a compound that we use to make the surface of the roads. The very top layer of the roads is surfacing. For surfacing roads, for making the surface of the roads, we use a compound called bitumen. So we take the residue, we turn the residue into bitumen, and we use it for surfacing our uh, roads. 
Now, so this is basically what our fractional distillation, or that is how we separate our uh, uh, oil into different fractions. The different components separate because they have different boiling points. Crude oil is generally heated to about 400 degrees centigrade to vaporize all the different parts of the mixture. So first we heat it up. We first heat it up to vaporize all of it. Then each fraction is obtained by collecting hydrocarbons, which have a boiling point in given range of temperature. For example, petrol contains molecules which have boiling point between 30 and 110. So what are we basically going to do? When we are going to reach the area over here for our uh, petrol, it's going to have the temperature around 30 and 110. So between this temperature, those particular um, molecules, they are going to condense back into liquid and they will collect over here. So based on the boiling point, we are going to separate from each other. At the very bottom, you generally have bigger hydrocarbons because bigger the hydrocarbon, the um, bigger the hydrocarbon, basically um, the higher boiling point they have. And at the top, you generally have smaller hydrocarbons. So this is again how we get our uh, crude oil, how we refine the crude oil and how we use crude oil. Other than crude oil, we also have other fossil fuels, right? We have coal and we have natural gases. Now, the reason we call them fossil fuels is because they actually form from dead plants and animals, not just uh, the, the, your coal and natural gas, oil as well. All three fossil fuels are actually because of the, um, the what do you call it, your dead animals and your dead plants turning into fossil fuels over million and million and million of years. For example, let's talk about coal, right? So coal, generally what happens is that, let's say you have a piece of tree that fell down. Piece of tree fell down and now it has, it has started to die. So the leaves are starting to dry, your wood is starting to die. Now, what is going to end up happening that as your dead tree is going to fall down, they will become buried by the mud. When they will become buried by the mud, this will prevent aerobic decay. What is aerobic decay? Breakdown of the dead matter in presence of oxygen. So when oxygen is there and you're breaking down dead matter, that is known as aerobic decay. So this will be prevented, right? Because now there is a layer of mud not allowing the oxygen to come into contact. Now, this will not, this will happen, this will continue happening for a million of years. I'm talking about that one tree. That one tree will stay there for a million of years. And what is going to happen during those million of years, the earth is going to be moving. The earth's crust, we know earth's crust has got multiple layers. We know that underneath all those layers, we have got different plates that are known for shifting. That they're the reasons we get earthquakes and tsunamis and all that. So movement of the earth's crust, movement of the plates will cause that piece of wood will cause that tree to you know keep on sinking down and down and down and down and down and that piece of tree is going to keep on you know just going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the earth after that what will happen an aerobic decay will start so the decay will start they will start breaking it down the bacteria that are present but without the presence of oxygen and millions and millions or millions of years are going to pass by the process will keep on happening and eventually that wood is going to turn into a piece of coal because of the anaerobic decay and at the same time the high pressure and the heat that is acting on it so pressure and heat that is acting on it that will is basically what will turn it because it is getting buried deeper and deeper and deeper into the earth's surface. So the heat on it, uh, the heat is of course going to increase and the pres pressure on it is going to increase. And that is how it is actually going to end up uh, turning into coal. Just like that, same thing you can talk about um, when you are talking about your oil and gas so this entire process that i just told you this already happened okay so we actually believe that you know this is where the coals came from the coal that we can find right now they were like these trees that stood on the earth's surface 
millions and millions and millions and millions of years ago. So they were those trees. So we believe those trees at that time broke down. Then this entire process happened. And now we can see our poles. Now we can use our poles. So um, that then we have oil and gas. Oil and gas both formed in a similar way. Generally, we believe oil and gas are also formed from the remains of plants, animals that once lived in sea and lakes. Right, so similar process happened that the uh, material sank to the bottom of the sea, became covered in mud, and then it kept on getting buried down and down and down. So that is how you actually get your fossil fuel. Any confusion so far? No. All right. Now, how do we use fossil fuel for energy? we do the process of combustion. What is the process of combustion? The process of combustion is basically, uh, just give me one second. Okay, the process of, of uh, combustion is basically when you take your fossil fuel and you burn it in oxygen. That's what we do. If I have a piece of coal, what do I do? I have a piece of coal. Coal is what? Coal is carbon. I take my coal, I burn it in oxygen and I get carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. That is combustion of coal. This is combustion of your hydrocarbon. For example, the type of hydrocarbon you will find in oil. Methane is a gas. It's your natural gas. Methane is your natural gas. Methane will burn in oxygen to give you carbon dioxide and water. And along with that, it will also give you your energy. So that is how combustion of fossil fuel takes place. What are the uses of fossil fuel? We already know that uses of fossil fuel are like really vast, right? I mean, pretty much a lot of the things that are done in our industry are done with fossil fuels. You want to heat anything up, what will you use? A fossil fuel. You want to uh, blast furnace when we just studied extraction of metals before this. So blast furnace, what were we using? We were using fossil fuels, right? Fossil fuels are basically uh, the most common thing that you can use whenever you want to heat anything up. Now, when we are talking about our uh, fossil fuels, we need to know what is the uh, what are the requirements for a perfect fuel, okay? What are the requirements that uh, will give you a perfect fuel? So perfect fuel should be cheap. It should be available in large quantities. It should be safe to store and transport, easy to ignite and burn, causing no pollution, and capable of releasing large amounts of energy. So you can go ahead and first of all see. Fossil fuels are cheap. Generally speaking, yes, fossil fuels are cheap. They are available in large quantities, but they are finite. They are non-renewable, right? We have a certain amount of coal, natural gas, and our uh, crude oil. When we are, when they have finished within the Earth's crust, that is it. We are done. So fossil fuel is not, even though it is available in large quantities, it is still a finite source. It is a non-renewable source. Safe to store and transport, that matters. For example, talk about your petrol or your natural gas. They are generally not that safe. When you talk about, uh, for example, coal, coal is safer to transport because it is solid. When you talk about your uh, petrol or your uh, kerosene or your diesel or your natural gas, they are more likely to catch fire easily, so they are not that safe. They cause no pollution. That's not true. We know that they are responsible for causing pollution because they produce carbon dioxide. So that is actually uh, something that we 
don't want and they are capable of releasing large amounts of energy they are so right now fossil fuel is one of the most common fuels that we use but out of all of them you can see that they don't meet the criteria for the perfect fuel which is why we are searching for an alternative source of fuel and another type of fuel or another source of energy that will be uh, that will be better than this so talking about by the way our pollution right so generally speaking when i talk about pollution the main pollution that we are getting is the greenhouse effect that is what is happening we are getting something known as the greenhouse effect what is greenhouse effect greenhouse there are two greenhouse gases we have carbon dioxide and we have methane so carbon dioxide and methane are two major greenhouse gases that are present and what actually happens is that generally uh when we are going to talk about it the this is the earth surface so generally the rays of the sun are able to reach the surface of the earth so okay before we talk about that basically what happens is that these greenhouse gases so your carbon dioxide and your what do you call it your carbon dioxide and your um methane they increase inside our atmosphere right they increase in our atmosphere because of this entire thing we are burning fossil fuel we are uh, methane is generally produced in large quantities by animals so when we rear animals when we uh, you know um, uh, when we uh, keep the animals and we breed them and you know we increase their numbers for the purposes of meat and all that so that is one of the reasons why methane is increasing and carbon dioxide is increasing because you are burning fossil fuel so they actually make a layer like this on the around the earth's atmosphere so the sun rays are actually able to penetrate through it and come to the surface of the earth the surface of the earth is going to heat up it is going to heat up the surface of the earth right and when the surface of the earth heats up it will also start emitting the heat rays so generally the rays that come from the sun are known as ultraviolet rays so these ultraviolet rays are absorbed by the earth surface and the earth will start to produce infrared rays those infrared rays are sorry those infrared rays are not able to escape the carbon dioxide and they're not able to escape our layers of methane they're not able to escape the layer of greenhouse gases as a result the infrared radiation stays trapped inside the earth's atmosphere and that is what is causing our global warming so that is one of the main side effects of using fossil fuels one of the main disadvantages associated with it so from the sun we are getting ultraviolet rays so uh, if you've done physics then you might have an idea that our uh, different waves have different uh, wavelengths right so that is why this happens so your ultraviolet rays they are able to pass through the uh, greenhouse gases but this will cause the earth to heat up when the earth will heat up it will produce infrared uh, radiation in response because now it is heating up whenever an object heats up it it emits infrared radiation that infrared radiation is not able to pass through the uh, layer of greenhouse gases and it gets trapped inside the earth's atmosphere and that is causing the temperature of the earth to start to rise and that is why we are getting global warming making sense anything you want to ask no all right and then we have other sources of our uh, entire process as well right for example we have so now we are looking at alternative sources of energy so one of the alternative sources of energy that we have is nuclear power nuclear power is basically when you are doing a uh, nuclear fission so there are two processes we are not going to look at both because uh, but if you do physics you will go through both of them in physics nuclear fission is when you are breaking uh, just give me one second
Right, so we have our uh, nuclear uh, fission, right? Nuclear fission is basically when you are going to take a radioactive element, right? For example, like uranium. So uranium is one of the most common radioactive elements that we have. And when I'm talking about it, what you do is, is that you throw a neutron. So we know what neutrons are. We have done protons, neutrons. So you take a neutron and you shoot it at the nucleus of uranium. So that's a radioactive material. Radioactive materials are unstable materials that can break down into uh, smaller compounds and they can basically give you energy as well. So what you do is, is you should put a neutron into it. What happens is the nucleus of uranium is going to split apart. It splits and it gives you smaller atoms. Along with giving you a smaller atom, it also gives you a huge amount of energy. It also produces a huge amount of energy. Now, this reaction is believed to be a chain reaction. How is it a chain reaction? That you are using one neutron to hit one nucleus of uranium. This nucleus of uranium is going to break apart. It will give you smaller fragments. And along with smaller fragments, it is also going to go ahead and give you three more neutrons. Then each neutron is going to go again to another piece of uranium. And then each uranium will again give you three more neutrons. Then three, so you now have nine neutrons. Then those nine neutrons will go and attack nine more uranium and then you will keep on. So it's a chain reaction. You start one, you start with one nucleus and it is basically going to go ahead and uh, it is going to hit the new uh, the nucleus of uranium and it is basically going to start splitting it apart into smaller fragments and neutrons the number of neutrons are going to keep on increasing and they will keep on breaking further nucleuses down and that is going to start a chain reaction And that is basically going to uh, start releasing huge amounts of energy. So this is what the process of nuclear fission is. That is how your uh, energy is actually going to be released. So this is known as nuclear power. Huge amounts of energy are released in this processes. But let's talk about, once again, the conditions for perfect fuel. Cheap nuclear fuel is not cheap. Nuclear fuel is pretty expensive. You need to have huge power stations to be able to do this entire process. We need to have huge power stations to do these processes. And we need to have uh, this getting your hand on the radioactive isotope is also not easy. It is really expensive. Then available in large quantities. Again, this is a finite source. Radioactive isotopes are finite. They're not renewable. So again, they might be available right now, but we have no guarantee that they will be there in the future. Able to store and transport safely. Once again, that is a huge problem. We can't store it safely. It has to be kept in huge lead containers. If there is any leakage, and this has happened, leakage from nuclear power stations has had severe effects. Leakage from nuclear power stations can cause them to produce, so the radioactive rays or the radiation is, can leak out of the nuclear power station and then start harming the people who live in the area. It causes no pollution, that's true it does not cause any pollution. It is capable of releasing large amounts of energy. Yes, it does release large amounts of energy. Another big problem is throwing away the waste products. The waste products are radioactive. Just like the compounds are radioactive, the waste products are also radioactive. So it is really hard to basically throw them away because they are, they are radioactive, so they have to be disposed in a proper way. Otherwise, if you throw them away just like that, what will happen? They will start producing radiation, and that radiation will start damaging the people who actually live in that area. It will start hurting the people who live in that area. So uh, your radiation is known to actually uh, cause, uh, when you talk about it, it is known to cause, for example, cancer. It is known to cause birth defects. It is known to, you know, cause a lot of genetic diseases as well. 
so that is uh, what uh, we are going to a problem of major problem of your nuclear power then we have hydraulic power hydraulic power is the one that we have sort of been studying ever since we were kids right we studied that oh we will go ahead and we'll take a slope and from the slope we will let the water run down and over here we have a turbine and what is going to happen that the water is going to come it is going to rotate the turbine and as it is going to rotate the turbine electricity is going to be generated right so that is what we have been studying we have studied this before as well the water is going to come down a slope and it is of course going to come down with a lot of energy and this is going to be known as hydro hydraulic energy or hydroelectric energy and hydroelectric energy when the when the if water is going to be coming down it's going to have a quite a lot of energy in it and because it's going to have so much pressure so much energy when it will reach the turbine it will rotate the turbine when it will rotate the turbine your hydraulic energy is going to be transformed into electrical energy and that electrical energy is what we so this uh, turbine is connected to what it is connected to a generator so when the turbine is going to rotate the generator will rotate and the generator will start producing electrical energy so that is what hydraulic power actually is when we talk about hydraulic power it is cheap making the uh, dam is costly that is correct making the dam is costly but once the dam has been made it is cheap because you don't need anything you just need water making the initial power station making your hydraulic power station is expensive but once it is made then it is cheap because you don't need to add any fossil fuel you don't need to add anything to it it is just going to uh, uh, it's just going to keep on working available in large quantities yes we do have large quantities of water available safe to store and transport definitely safe to store and transport it does not cause any pollution and it is capable of releasing large amounts of energy but uh it also comes with a disadvantage the disadvantage that is going to uh, co it comes with is that it often requires valleys to be flooded and communities to be moved so if i want to uh, i need like one of the things over here was available in large quantities it is available in large quantities and it is renewable but generally speaking for this particular situation you need to have water in very very huge quantities you need to have water in very huge quantities inside dams and stuff like that so keeping such huge amounts of water keeping such large amounts of water is uh, means that we have to you know literally flood areas we literally have to you know flood the areas allow the river to flood the entire area and because of that we have to move people we have to evacuate villages you know we have to do all of that so that is a problem with hydraulic power then of course we also have wind energy right and then we have something a bit newer that is biomass energy biomass energy when you is when you take any biological material and you turn it into energy so for example you are taking plants right when you are taking plants and then you are using plants to give you energy for example wood when you are burning wood what are you doing you are taking a plant and you're turning it into energy right or so that is basically known as biomass energy so methane generated by the digestion of animal waste is called biogas so when the animal waste products you know the animal fecal matter when it is digested by the bacteria the bacteria produce methane this methane is called as biogas if this biogas can be collected and it's easy to collect on an industrial scale this biogas or this methane can be collected it can be used for cooking heating and lighting right and when the by product of this process is an excellent fertilizer so methane when we're generally talking about it can be used to make something known as biogas and biogas uh, sorry methane is biogas and it can be made from animal waste and the good thing about is it is that is that when you are using it 
it is not going to give you uh, it is going to give you a, a fertilizer that can then be used for of course growing more crops and stuff then we also have ethanol ethanol is a new biofuel that is coming out ethanol is uh, burns cleanly ethanol burns cleanly ethanol is generally a good biofuel uh, your um, uh, so these are biofuels biofuels are generally just uh, when you are turning energy from animal material or plant material so examples of this is for example wood when you're burning wood you are getting a biofuel when you're using ethanol so ethanol we can get from fermentation ethanol is basically a, a biofuel your methane is a biofuel then we have hydrogen gas hydrogen gas is can be used to make energy as well so hydrogen gas will burn in oxygen to give you water hydrogen gas can burn in oxygen to give you water it is very clean it gives you no pollutants whatsoever it gives you no pollutant whatsoever and it is really 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 clean also it can be obtained in almost unlimited what uh, unlimited quantities from electrolysis of water so by doing electrolysis of electrolysis of water we can get as much hydrogen as we want so it is a renewable source of energy right it is renewable <laughs> no pollution is created it burns very clean it gives you no pollution whatsoever and it is going you can it is completely renewable but it is super duper 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 costly because again you're doing electrolysis and you and i know how expensive electrolysis can be so that was it about the different sources of fuels that we have that can be that we can use to provide energy any confusion so far anything you want to ask not really no but um what's like the best type of energy not best type of energy but best method of extracting energy is it hydro uh, hydro energy yeah generally speaking if you're talking about so right now we don't have the perfect fuel so remember the conditions that we talked about we don't have perfect fuel that meets all of these conditions right now we don't have this so we have different fuels that have got different sources that have got different advantages and different disadvantages that is where we are right now speaking in ideal terms if we can find a way to make hydrogen uh, hydrogen fuel cheaper if we can find a way to make this hydrogen uh, 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 as fuel cheaper this would be a very very good source of energy because it is available in large quantities you can it is renewable hydrogen gas is generally safe to transport as well it causes no pollution and it gives you huge amounts of energy the only problem with hydrogen as fuel is of course that it is too expensive at the moment so if we can find a way to make it cheaper hydrogen is a very 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 good source of energy but uh, generally speaking yeah uh, so um as for which one is the best that is again going to depend upon the situation you are dealing with right because all of them have their advantages and disadvantages there is not one specific uh, fuel that you can say that it has got a significantly higher advantage preferably we would prefer renewable sources of energy so either we go for solar power solar power is very good but again solar power is expensive in setting up and solar power when you talk about it it is uh, you, it is uh, there during the day and then at night of course uh, you have to rely on something else so we have solar power solar power is pretty good your hydraulic energy is pretty good your um, but like i said hydraulic energy is then depending upon having that ge that geographical area you need to have those valleys you need to have those geographical areas where you can uh, flood the area and then use the of water for the um so this is generally done in mountainous areas so for all of them you have certain advantages and certain disadvantages so at the moment generally speaking renewable sources of energy are preferable over fossil fuel 
or over even nuclear power. Uh, when we talk about it, nuclear power gives us no pollution, but nuclear power is also non-renewable. So renewable forces of energy generally are preferable and better, but then in renew uh, renewable sources, then different uh, energies have got different advantages and disadvantages. So that's going to depend upon where you are living, what are you, how much energy you require, and all those different sort of questions. All right, does, does that make sense? Yes. All right, so talking about, now let's go into our uh, different type of chemical reactions, right? So we can have two major types of chemical reactions. We can have exothermic reactions and we can have endothermic reactions, okay? Exothermic reactions are those reactions that will produce energy that will produce energy, those are known as exothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions are those reactions that will, that will absorb energy. So endothermic reactions are those reactions that will absorb energy. Exothermic reactions are those reactions that give out heat energy. So for example, if I'm talking about an exothermic reaction, what will happen? I will see that the surroundings are going to get hotter. My surroundings are going to get hotter. If I'm doing the reaction in a beaker, my beaker will get hotter. Why? Because it is producing heat energy. Endothermic reaction is the opposite. It absorbs the energy from the surroundings. So the surroundings will get colder. So if I'm doing the reaction in a beaker, the beaker will actually get colder because the energy is being absorbed from the beaker. Now, this is generally what happens. In exothermic reaction, the, um, the reactants have higher energy compared to the products. Your products are at a lower energy level and your reactants are at a higher energy level. So your reactants have a higher energy level and your products are at a lower energy level. So when you want to find out energy change, the formula we use for energy change is basically product minus reactant. So your reactants are at a lower energy level and products are at a higher energy level. So when I do that, I get my answer, for example, as negative 10. So that is why an exothermic reaction is producing heat because the reactants have more energy, products have less energy. So during that time, you can see since the products have less energy, what happens to the rest of the energy? It is given out to the surroundings. And that is why your exothermic reactions produce heat. Talk about them a bit more specifically. Let's explain, let's discuss what is happening at a molecular level. So what is going to happen is that your these are my compounds, methane and oxygen. Now, before I can do the reaction between methane and oxygen, I need to break the bonds between them. So I will have to provide some sort of energy. For example, I had to provide 20 joules of energy. Fine. I had to point, give out 20 joules of energy. And basically what is going to happen, I had to provide this much energy so that the bonds between your uh, methane and oxygen can break. Now, once the bonds between ethane and oxygen are going to be broken, methane oxygen going to be broken, new bonds will be made. Carbon dioxide will be made and water will be made. So what is going to happen when the bonds are going to be made, energy is going to be released. When the bonds are going to be made, energy is going to be released. So remember this, bond breaking requires energy. We have to give energy to break the bonds. So bond breaking is actually an endothermic process. Bond making, when the bonds are being made, that is an exothermic process. Energy is released when bonds are going to be made. So in an exothermic reaction, basically, what is going to end up happening? Hold on one second, let me show you. So in endothermic reaction, basically what ends up happening is that the energy being released from making the bonds is more than the energy we have to give to break the bonds. So the energy I that is being released, the energy that is being released from making the bond is greater than the energy we have to give to make break the bonds. 
So the energy output, the energy output we are getting, the energy output that is from making the newborns, this is our output. So our energy output that we are getting from making the newborns is greater than our energy input. And input is what? when we provide energy to break the bonds. So that is an exothermic reaction. In an exothermic reaction, the energy to break the bonds is less than the energy that we get from making the bonds. In endothermic reaction, it is the opposite. In endothermic reaction, the energy we get from making the bonds is less than the energy we need to give to break the bonds. So that is what basically ends up happening. And when we are going to uh, take a look over here, so um, look, this is born. Of, so they basically often ask you to do calculations related to bond energy. So they give you the bonds, they give you the energy of the bonds, and they say, tell us, is it is it an endothermic reaction or is it an exothermic reaction? So what do you do is is that you basically go ahead and this energy is going to be given to you. The energy of the different bonds. So first of all, we write down what bonds are being broken. So the bonds that are being broken are in methane. We have four carbon hydrogen bonds. So we are making breaking four carbon hydrogen bonds. Along with that, we are going to be breaking our oxygen uh, uh, bonds as well. So between oxygen bonds, you can see we have two molecules of oxygen. So we are breaking two oxygen bonds because we have two molecules of oxygen those are the those are the energy for bond breaking so you can see we have 435 is the energy to break carbon hydrogen bond we will multiply it by four then for oxygen oxygen double bond we have 497 and we have two oxygen molecules so we will multiply it by two that is going to give you the answer of 200 and 2734 then you're going to see what bonds are being made. So you are making two bonds between carbon and oxygen. And then you're making two, uh, four bonds between hydrogen and oxygen. Over here, four bonds between hydrogen and oxygen and two bonds between carbon and oxygen. So you are going to go ahead and write down like this. So carbon double bond oxygen is 803. Multiply that by two plus hydrogen oxygen bond is 464. Multiply that by four. You add it up, you will get 3462 kilojoules. So you can clearly see the energy we are getting from making the bonds is greater than the energy to break the bonds. To solve it, you will do energy to, you will do breaking minus making that is how we solve it okay so you will do energy to break the bonds minus energy to make the bonds basically input minus output so energy to break the bonds minus energy to make the bonds so you will do 2734 minus 3462 and you will get your answer as minus 728 the negative sign shows you the fact that this is an exothermic reaction and heat is being released, energy is being released. Is this making sense? Yes. All right. So a post, okay, so we got a negative sign over here. In an endothermic reaction, the energy to make the bonds or the energy we are getting from making the bonds is going to be less than the energy we are getting from breaking of bonds. So in that situation, you are going to end up getting a positive sign. So an endothermic reaction will have a positive sign. Exothermic reaction has a negative sign. Now, this particular diagram you're seeing, this is known as an energy level diagram. It's pretty much the same as what we did over here. There's only one difference, and the difference is that in it, we have included something known as activation energy. Activation energy is the minimum amount of energy that the molecules need to have to undergo reaction. The minimum amount of energy that your reactants need to have for the reaction to go forward. By the way, enthalpy is just the name for the energy stored in the bonds. So the energy that is stored in the bonds, we call it enthalpy. That's it. So everything we have studied so far, this is all enthalpy. This is all enthalpy. So it's nothing to get confused over. Enthalpy is simply the energy stored in the 
bonds and we show it by writing down delta H. Delta means change and H is going to start for enthalpy. Okay. So for exothermic reaction, delta H is negative. For endothermic reaction, delta H is positive. This is the diagram for exothermic reaction. You can clearly see that the reactants have a higher energy level. Products have a low energy level. And of course, you have activation energy over here. This activation energy has to be overcome before it can turn into product. From here to here, you have activation energy. And from here to here, you are going to have your delta H, that is enthalpy change, your energy change. From here to here, you have your energy change. And this is the activation energy. Labeling of this is important because you get different, you have to do proper labeling depending upon the type of graph. For example, in endothermic reaction, this is what it looks like. So in endothermic reaction, from here to here is your enthalpy change. So see, this is why that is important because from here to here is the enthalpy change in exothermic reaction. In endothermic reaction, the entire thing is basically, uh, sorry, not the entire thing. The entire thing is basically going to be your activation energy. This entire thing is going to be your activation energy. And then from here to here, that is going to be your energy change. So this is what you have to see. And the activation energy in your exothermic reaction is pretty small. In endothermic reaction, it is pretty big. And as you can see, all the way from the bottom to the very top is activation energy. And then from here to here, product to reactant is your heat change. In exothermic reaction, product to reactant is the heat change. And then from the peak over here till the reactant is going to be your activation energy. All right, any confusion, anything you want to ask so far? Oh, no. All right, then we need to go over and go over enthalpy of combustion. What is enthalpy of combustion? Everything we have studied so far, it is exactly the same thing, only it is for a combustion reaction. So I'm being specific, right? I'm saying, oh, this is for a combustion reaction. That is enthalpy of combustion. The energy change that will take place in a combustion reaction. So it is nothing different. It is nothing new. It is nothing different than what we have studied so far. It is still energy change, still bond making and bond breaking. But when we are now talking specifically about combustion reaction, that's it. So enthalpy of combustion is basically the uh, enthalpy change when one mole of a compound is burned in oxygen. So when you burn one mole of any compound, one mole of any compound in oxygen that is going to be your enthalpy of combustion. So the heat energy that is going to be released when you're going to burn one mole of any compound in oxygen, that is enthalpy of combustion. And then we have enthalpy of neutralization. Once again, what is enthalpy of neutralization? The heat energy or the energy change that is going to take place when one mole of hydrogen ions are neutralized. So when one mole of hydrogen ions are neutralized, and we will study neutralization. When we do acids and bases, we will do neutralization. When one mole of hydrogen ions are going to be neutralized, that is going the energy change that will take place, that is going to be known as enthalpy of neutralization. So your hydrogen ions will react with hydroxide ions to give you water. And this is basically what neutralization reaction actually is. All right, so um, we'll go ahead and we'll uh, stop it over here for today. So we're almost basically done with the topic. In the next class, we're going to go ahead and just quickly do changes of state, which I'm sure you know, and then we will do our battery or cell. So we had to do our fuel cell and we had to do all of that. So we'll go ahead and we'll cover that in the next class. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, can you upload the PowerPoints on the uh, website? Okay. Because...